May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Last Tuesday morning, as I was scrolling through the news on my phone, I saw this headline from the Sacramento Bee, quote, it's like God has no sympathy, unquote. Wine country shaken by relentless wildfires. Of course, any headline with the word God in it is going to catch my eye especially during a week when I'm working on a sermon. But this one was particularly striking for a couple of reasons. First, because someone quoted on the Apple News feed was saying out loud what I imagine some have been secretly thinking. It's like God has no sympathy. And not just about wildfires what people have been secretly thinking over the last several months, months during which people all over the world have continued to fall ill and die from COVID-19, months during which our economy has been shut down to slow its spread, and during which later attempts to reopen have in some places led to new surges and in infection, months that have shown that though COVID's impacts are more keenly felt by the poor and the vulnerable, still this disease knows no favorites and has no respect for wealth or office. And that's just the pandemic part. During these same several months, deep divisions in our country about our national leadership, about race and its history in the United States, and about our identity and role in the world have been laid bare. Crises sometimes do bring out the best in us and sometimes they bring out the very worst. And if that wasn't enough, the catastrophic fire that precipitated that headline is still burning. An early harbinger of a longer and deadlier season that is clearly not anomalous, but rather growing evidence of the impacts of rising temperatures and deeper droughts and population expansion into higher risk areas. As the glass fire swept through neighborhoods and vineyards that burned just two and three years ago and threatened the home, that Sonoma County Supervisor Sue Gorin had been in the process of rebuilding, she articulated this feeling of helplessness and fear of divine abandonment to forces that threaten our very survival. So yeah, we get it. It almost feels like God has no sympathy, like God must be turning God's face away, giving up on all of us. The other reason the headline was so striking is because it just so happens that how God feels about a crisis going on in a vineyard is the crucial point in the parable that Jesus tells in this morning's gospel. And no, no one has been messing with the lectionary. Now, before we get to the details of Jesus' story, we need to remind ourselves that though you and I may be 2,000 years distant from the Palestine of Jesus' time, vineyards represent a lot of the same things in our culture as they do in theirs. When I think of wine country, whether it's up in San Inez or Napa or in the Finger Lakes region of Upper New York State, or France, or Spain, or Portugal, I imagine these rolling hills and luxuriant vines and heavy bunches of grapes and wine, delicious wine that is enjoyed and shared in times of relaxation and friendship and celebration and gratitude. Vineyards evoke the good life, right? In the Hebrew scriptures, vineyards were just as beautiful and evocative. People planted them when they were no longer worried about just getting by. 
The cultivation of grapes signified stability and fruitfulness and hope for the future. A vineyard is the first thing that Noah planted after he and his family and the animals came down out of the ark in anticipation of this new world that they were going to build. Much later, when God's people were trying to hold on in the wilderness of Sinai, during the exile in Babylon, and in times of drought, their preachers promised them that one day they would plant vineyards again. There would be new wine. There would be a future. There would be fruitfulness and joy once more. And the vineyard was used as a metaphor for God's good creation and for God's people. God being the owner who cares for all of God's planting, who dreams for its future, who determines, is determined, that it and they will yield good grapes, that they will be fine wine. So when Jesus tells a parable about bad things happening in a vineyard, it's not about bad things happening. It is about bad things happening to a business that is about fruitfulness and thriving and community and hope. He begins with this landowner who is building a vineyard, which then is now is no small undertaking. It involves fencing and equipment and a watchtower and I'm sure the first century Palestinian equivalent of a really fine irrigation system. Once it's all planted and ready to go, the owners finds tenants to lease it, which means that they are going to live on it and work it and in exchange for their work, keep a portion of its produce and return the rest to him. Then he takes off for a far country, presumably, to manage his other business interests. After the harvest, the owner sends a couple of his slaves back to collect his share of the yield. And as we heard, the tenants beat them up and kill one. The owner sends a second, larger team, hoping that they will convince the tenants to honor their part in the arrangement and turn over what they owe him. But the same thing happens. And then finally, he sends his son. Surely they will respect him enough to be accountable. But no, the tenants, somehow imagining that if they can get rid of this rightful heir, are going to get the vineyard. They kill the son, too. Okay, so clearly, these tenants are living in some kind of an alternative universe. Maybe some owners, after that first beating and killing, would have given them another chance. But failing second and then third chances won't even the most gracious and forgiving of landowners lower the boom. Clearly, Jesus hearers think so because When he asks them what the owner should do with these tenants, they answer, he should put those wretches to a miserable death and then replace them with others who will make good on their obligations. Now, do you notice that Jesus doesn't pick up on this idea of punishing the tenants who abused the owner's trust and killed his son? No, instead he reminds them that a rejected stone can become a cornerstone, that something that appears to be fail and faulty can turn out to be what holds everything else together, even as those who don't recognize it for what it is stumble over it and fall. It's not that God doesn't have sympathy. God errs on the side of sympathy and even naivete giving a second chance and then a third and paying for it dearly. Only then does God finally step back and let them experience the consequences of their choice, presumably throwing them off the property and going looking for tenants who are going to be more willing to be accountable. Tenants who will share in rebuilding what has fallen down or burn who will tend the vines in God's vineyard, in God's world, 
who will partner with God in producing the fruits of the kingdom. The county supervisor who was quoted in that headline about God not being sympathetic, according to the article, in fact, blames the worsening fire threat not on a heavenly cause, but on a human one, climate change. Rising temperatures have dried California's vegetation even more than normal and made a single spark far, far more likely to cause ruinous conflagrations. More than 3.75 million acres have burned statewide since January 1st, far more than any year on record. Friends, the crises of climate change and pandemic are both in many ways beyond our control and yet, at the same time, they are our responsibility to address and to mitigate as best as we can. The parable insists that you and I be accountable. God expects things from us. God calls us to be good stewards of what we have been given, to take care of the vineyard that is our world that is our community. We have been given second chances and third ones. And still, our God is not out to punish us. Our God simply stands alongside us and grieves with us when we suffer the consequences, whether it is because we are reaping what we have sown or because we have somehow been caught down the line of causation. God calls us to repent and make amends as we can, and then to seek out those vineyards where God is busy planting new vines and putting up towers and getting ready to grow good grapes. I would say, after hearing James this morning, to seek out those vineyards where people are finding ways to care for and serve one another. The parable promises us that they are out there wherever people are working together for thriving and fruitfulness and healing and hope in this world that God so loves, this world that God has graciously entrusted to you and to me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.